Well, it was grimy, it was glorious, it was the golden age of rail. Well, it's very hard for us these days to imagine, to understand what rail was when it came to this country over a century ago. That was the age of steam. That was the time when people would flock to the railway lines to pay homage to the great steam trains as they rolled through. Tonight we'll take you on a journey into the past. Back in the 1860s, stagecoach was about all there was if you wanted to travel overland, and a slow and bone-jarring ride it was too. Well, there she was, the first New Zealand railway track. So imagine the excitement that surrounded our first public rail service, Christchurch to the River Estuary at Ferrymead. 1863 was the year this was progress. Up till that point in time, ever since time began, the fastest man had ever travelled was astride a horse. And all of a sudden, we, we had this uh, fire-consuming, belching, smoke-belching conveyance, which uh, on test of 60 miles an hour on the Canterbury Railways. Now, that was absolutely unheard of. But it was in the 1860s it really began. In an ambitious gesture, Sir Julius Vogel borrowed £10 million and embarked on a vast public works... This was the first government to plunge our young nation into serious debt. It wouldn't, of course, be the last. Steel roads began to network the land and the public flocked to use them. There were excursions. Here we are in the early 1900s. The locals are heading off for a picnic at Bluff. Of course, it was all done on a shoestring budget and as an economy measure, narrow gauge tracks were chosen. Nonetheless, picture the excitement when the iron horse roared into town. The whole town would, would turn out to watch the train arrive. Uh, it was the event of the day. I mean, people set their watches by the train's arrival and departure. That's how important it was. It was part of the warp and weave of the whole fabric of society. In 1908, the American Great White Fleet visited Auckland. The building of the main trunk line was barely complete, but the Premier of the day, Sir Joseph Ward, had no intention of missing this splendid occasion. The ladies were in their finery. Officials hurried about, getting in one another's way. This was a truly historic occasion. With some last-minute construction, the Prime Ministerial train made the inaugural journey. In honour of this event, the Premier himself drove a ceremonial silver spike into the last sleeper of the main trunk. The new era had begun. For 50 years, people had dreamed of this day. The gap had been closed. These days, the spike wouldn't have lasted the night. Indeed, it was retrieved a few minutes later, but the whereabouts of the silver spike today remains a mystery. Nevertheless, there's a monument to mark the spot. Today, unheeding trains pass this deserted place where 50 years ago the railheads met. Yes, it was the great era of the steam engine. Now, New Zealand had its own workshops to build these behemoths, workshops in which generations of apprentices learned their trade. Uh, places like Hillside. An 800 weight coupling rod, white shaped by a two ton steam hammer. Between 1889 and 1956, hundreds of steam locomotives were turned out by workshops around the country. Part must fit perfectly in an engine that has to haul heavy loads over thousands of miles without the slightest trouble. A coat of paint and a head of steam and another engine is ready for trials. Every class of engine rolled out and you got to know your trains and if you knew a thing or two about rail, you could recognise an AB class from a DX or in this case, a JA class. The build at the rate of one every seven weeks is a major engineering job and one that the men at Hillside can be justly proud of. Freight was always going to be the romance was in train travel and in the early years cars were few roads were appalling the steam engine was king for the people who lived in like move for the passenger traveling on the on the steam train well up the front it was uh, in the second class cars it was pretty uncomfortable i suppose they were noisy and dirty gritty and smoky the first class cars down the back well they were bad air, forced air conditioning and all sorts of things and they were much more comfortable much better seats so it was really a pretty good ride down the back but there was something magical about steam travel, wasn't there? I mean, some people loved it. They're the most magnificent 
machine that man has ever built. They are the machine that most uh, epitomizes man himself because they can be awkward, they can be willful, they can be magnificent, they can, they can do things that they're not supposed to be able to do. And on other days they're absolutely hopeless. And they are also um, a challenge to a, a, a skilled team of, a, of an engine driver and a fireman to make that machine work at its absolute best. I guess Bill, it would have taken um, quite a bit of teamwork to get one of these things going. Oh yes, the fireman had to keep up the steam pressure because uh, especially on a hill area, the uh, engine was designed to work at a maximum pressure and if the steam pressure got down, well the train goes slower and it makes it harder for the driver. So if the fireman keeps up his steam pressure, he's got to keep up the water as well and it makes it a lot easier for the driver to run the train. Those tunnels must have been miserable. Well, some of the tunnels, you had the smoke, the steam, the heat and by the time you got through the tunnel when an engine was working hard, you were looking for the air, it was just, you know, it was very stifling, it was, it was stifling. Well, if the trains themselves weren't too flash, the places of departure most certainly were. The Dunedin Railway Station is among New Zealand's grandest pieces of architecture. It was built at a time when railway builders believed they were organising the... To its builders, Dunedin Station must have seemed an ornate echo of a distant home and a symbol of confidence in the developing railways and commerce of a young colony. However, when it opened, it was criticised for its costliness. Even the lavatories were said by the city's strong Scottish element to be too luxurious. There's a train journey is an upheaval, an interlude in their normal lives. They scramble for their cups of tea and sandwiches and coffees of the evening paper, while the porters and pillow sellers and bookseller girls look after their comfort. Station master ringing the bell, Murphy. Very big man, the station master. Oh yes, most important man in town. He was. Uh, he had an empire all of his own, you know. And he he had porters. He came up through the ranks, and he ran the railway station. He ran this section of the railway, and everything he did was important. All the freight, all the passengers in and out. There were all sorts of books and things to be kept. He had a big and important job, but he was much looked up, up to in the town. So he was an important man. And of course, one of his responsibilities was the, the legendary railways refreshment oh, room too. I mean, yes, <laughs> railway refreshment rooms. Well, New Zealand Railways, I think, took the last dining car off in 1919. You see, the war had stopped a year before and they did it as a, as a, as a wartime measure, which proved that even then they were running late sometimes. <laughs> I think that's the story, if I remember rightly. So the train would stop in the middle of the night. The doors would open and disgorge the passengers, jump down onto the platform, race across into this, this big, brightly lit room, and, and there they were, all these women in the nice starched uniforms, all ready for them. And they, they'd pour across the counter and the cups of tea and the coffee would go and the block cakes and the sandwiches and, and the pies. And everybody would take them back on board the train. So yeah, the refreshment rooms were very vital and very important to the railways and to the community and to the people travelling on the trains. Because God, you need something to see you through for the next three or four hours, you see. And I love that mad rush out to refreshment rooms, even if they're refreshments at four. But I love the mad dive and all the silly people, you know. It's gorgeous. Well, for an emerging country, our expanding rail network was proof of our sterling efforts at breaking this country in. And our filmmakers proudly hailed our achievements. Hundreds of feet above the bush, the viaduct stands silent. Only the clatter of the trains applaud the men who worked here. This was the great era of bridge and tunnel building as engineers grappled with the rugged New Zealand landscape. New Zealand gained a very high regard for its engineering skills. Uh, we made things like the Railrimu Spiral, the Rimutaka Incline. We built locomotives which stood in comparison with the best of, uh, of overseas locomotives. And if you look at a book on railways, say from the 1920s or 30s, you'll find there are significant entries about New Zealand. Uh, it, it was regarded as uh, a model for overseas narrow gauge railways. We, we did it right. The fells, that's my memory. Crabbing up the centre rail as though it wasn't the one in fifth grade. The Rimutaka Rangers presented their own special problem. 
Here was such a steeply graded incline that no conventional locomotive could operate on it. Enter these gutsy little engines, the Fell locomotives. This engine's the pride of the Fell. 77 years up and down the three mile climb. And still the same accent she brought from Bristol. The puffingest engines ever. The Rimutaka Incline was considered one of the railway wonders of the world. The conditions were appalling. The engines blasted smoke something like 200 feet straight up into the air. And of course, when they came to the tunnels, and there were three on the line, then this suddenly became confined into a narrow rat hole, as they were called, and the smoke literally just was a solid wall outside. The Fell engines worked the incline for more than 80 years before the line was closed finally in 1955. They made Mrs. Marker a presentation. She'll be the only one left at the creek when we're gone. All alone with her memories and ours. Fair makes you think. The Prime Minister arrives for the official opening of the Rumataka Tunnel. In its place, the Rimutaka Tunnel opened. Once again, it was an opportunity for the National Film Unit to reflect on our expanding nation with pride. In six years, the longest tunnel in the British Commonwealth has been built. The mountains are a barrier no longer. And to run these, all of these locomotives, you needed a whole army of people. Uh, at one stage, the government railways was the biggest employer in the country. And whole towns sprang up to serve the iron horse, places like Otira. A true railway town. They say even the dogs work on the railway here. Tonight there's to be a dance in the social hall. By evening at the little stations and halts down the line, groups of twos and threes are waiting to be picked up by the slow train. One of the refreshment room girls is already off duty and ready to show off her new dress. Social functions of this kind go on wherever railway people live. Because of the difficult hours they work, because they're often moved from one locality to another, because these localities are so often isolated, they have to depend very much on the company of their fellow railway workers for their social life, and a very good life they make. Wartime, its own impact on the rail, on wayside stations, people gather to wave. Grand plans for expansion had to be shelved, and wartime restrictions plunged rail travel into an overcrowded, over-regulated and unenjoyable experience. But as a troop mover, you couldn't fault New Zealand Rail. After all, they moved 40 million passengers in 1944 alone. Unfortunately, these heroic efforts were not viewed quite so warmly by the actual passengers. The wartime travel conditions were awful. And many, of course, were servicemen who uh, had just been cramped beyond belief in troop trains. And they got out of the army and vowed never again were they ever going to travel on a train. And many of them didn't. Immediately post-war, things weren't much better. There were coal shortages, there were staffing problems, and it has to be said the trains did not always run on time. Now, December 1953. A young country was feeling good about itself. We were in love with the young queen visiting our shores. But Christmas Eve 1953 would become a date etched forever in our history. Last night, a most grievous railway accident took place at Tangiwai. 151 people were lost in this, the country's worst rail disaster. It could have been many more, but for one man's courage. It happened too quickly for me to grasp the, uh, the strangeness of it. No, true. Have you got, the fools rushed in where angels fear their tread. That's all he can explain. Well, I must be a bloody fool, boy. Incredibly enough, brave man. Yeah, he had enough courage to get into that. Well, he knew what the outcome would have been or could have been. Yeah, I think he was just meant to be there at the right time. He must have been. And if he hadn't been there, we wouldn't be here either. Probably not. Tangawai. The Maori translates as weeping waters. <laughs> 
1950s, the age of steam was passing. Diesel electric uh, had been introduced in 1952, so the steam trains were phased out. They were scrapped or they were sent to the shunting yard. Rolling out of the Dunedin sheds comes New Zealand's latest steam locomotive, the latest and the last. She was built in 56, and we'll make no more like her, for the days of steam are passing. The powerful diesels were cheaper to run, they were faster, and they didn't turn your washing black. Over this switchback track, the diesels come into their own. On steep grades, steam locos can't come near them. Now there are fewer stops for water, and the sound of toiling steam isn't heard so often in the bush. Wellingtonian, of course, started commuting on an electrified network as early as 1938. The climb out of Wellington was too smoky on the steam trains, and the engines struggled when cold. So generations of Wellingtonians went to work on the cleaner, if less thrilling, electric lines. As the motor car gradually took over from rail, smaller lines began to disappear. The railways department was desperately looking for a modern image. Perhaps, they thought, the rail car would reverse the falling passenger numbers. It's the thrill of a lifetime for veteran driver Ernie Peach as he drives the first of the new diesel rail cars on its maiden trip from Wellington to Napier. Almost as excited is Mr McAlpine, Minister of Railways. It's articulated, he gesticulated. Still, if he wanted a long, it went into the vernacular. There are two overnight limiteds. One leaves at 4.30 and arrives at 7 a.m. The limited, of course, meant simply an express train with a limited number of stops. A score or so school children gave promise of a noisy journey and then off. People around the country were fascinated by the trains, weren't they? I mean, people would turn up to have a look at the train, do in at 10 minutes past 10. And oh, look, was... yeah, places like Tamarini, the, the, the folks and I. And so, yeah, it, it was an exciting time to see a big train stop and start again. Now, in 1960, the Minister of Railways, one Michael Mowen, had a dream of revolutionising rail passenger services in New Zealand. All seated on the Experimental Express, Wellington to Auckland in just 11 and a half hours. A special train, the Mowen Rocket, it was dubbed, was to be trialled at Wellington to Auckland run. It can be done. With lighter coaches and powerful diesels, with a regular daily schedule, a luxury daylight train could better the night limit in and a half hours. In the 1970s, we saw world-class trains make a return to New Zealand tracks. The Silver Star was a business market. The Silver Star certainly looks to be on an interesting inaugural run. Stuart? To arrest the passenger decline, today the Silver Star is still a luxury train, but it travels a track in Malaysia. Like the Kaimai Tunnel, one of the last great rail engineering feats in our country has proved to be the most demanding tunnel ever attempted by the Ministry of Works. After five years of work, there is still almost three quarters of a mile to... It took over ten years to build it. It's almost nine kilometres long. When it was finished, it became the longest tunnel in the Southern Hemisphere. Yet even the greatest engineering feats have their glitches. A mind-boggling 250-ton tunnelling machine is steadily boring a 21-foot diameter hole through the mountain. Unfortunately, uh, the giant tunnelling machine imported for the job turned out to be almost useless. The rock at the western end jammed its cutting head. So it was back to simpler methods and the expensive piece of machinery was sent to the easier eastern end. In the last decade, rail in New Zealand has undergone a revolution. After more than a century as a government department, it's now a privately owned company with a new name, Transrail, and a fraction of its former staff. And while the heyday of rail travel is well gone, some lines are enjoying a resurgence of interest. The Trans-Alpine line is one. In the past, it was purely the route from Christchurch to Greymouth. Today, it's a tourist attraction in its own right. There was a time we used to flock to the train tracks to stare at the express as it tore through town and we'd wave out to the driver and the driver would wave back to us. Today, most of us will never get on a train. And these days, the steam trains are sidelined to the museums or to the, to the hobby tracks. But you've only got to hear that long, hand of water.